Just a quick announcement, guys, before we jump into the video. Um, we've actually reached 10K subs on the YouTube channel, which is absolutely insane. A few months ago, I literally had no one watching my videos. I remember I, had, I was so happy to get one subscriber a day. I remember with some of the days I was losing subscribers. Um, it's just crazy to think that I've gotten this far in such a short amount of time. So thank you so much to everyone who's commented on my videos, joined the Discord, shared my videos to friends, whatever. All of it is, I'm so, so thankful. And I'm so glad that I've really been able to help so many of you within your ranked journey. And hopefully um, over this year, I can help more and more people get to their, their ranked goals in season 10. Um, and as a result, guys, I'm doing a coaching giveaway. So there's going to be three winners. And I'm going to, with those three people, I'll be doing a full VOD review of whichever game you want. And it's all going to be streamed. So um, make sure you enter, join the Discord, go into the announcements channel, click on that little, that little giveaway bot thing and make sure you enter. So um, thank you so much again. And let's dive straight into the video. Hey everyone, welcome to another video. Now guys, today this video is going to be very different to my usual content. I'm basically just going to be ranting in front of a camera, very vlog style, got my little webcam set up, got my nice little microphone here. This one's going to be interesting. I haven't really done many of these videos. If you want to see more of them at the end of the video, you can let me know. But if you think it's hogwash and you think that I'm just talking shit, uh, and we can have a little argument in, in the in the comments. You can say, Curtis, I can't believe you're telling me this useless information. You suck. Then you can unsubscribe, and then I'll report you, and then you can abuse me in Discord, then I'll block you there, and then we can have that little, that nice little uh, interaction, but I don't want to let it to get to that point, just let me know nicely, I don't want to see you do this again, and then I'll do some other content, but basically today, I'm going to be talking about improving at League of Legends in general, you know, problems I see with lower ELO players, what's the difference between like high ELO and low ELO players, um, some stuff with pro player stuff, um, you know, why they're basically not climbing, um, stuff about schedules, just a bunch of different stuff, all right? So some of it may be incredibly useful to you. Some of it might not be useful at all. Um, so yeah, like sit back, relax, grab a little notepad, grab a coffee and uh, sit tight, all right? So where we're going to start is we're going to start with solo queue schedules. And some of the tips that have actually really helped me play more games while staying focused within a day, okay? So my theory of improvement in League of Legends is it's better to play less games within a day, but within those less games that you're playing, you're going to be hyper-focused, more intense, and just applying a lot more concentration within the game. So I would rather someone play four or five games while being hyper-focused than 10 games on autopilot. Okay, that's just my personal preference. It's worked for me, might not work for everyone. I've just found it to be very helpful. Now, there's things that I've done and put into my schedule day in, day out that allow me to play more games while focused. The first one is actually getting a good night's sleep. So I try to sleep eight hours. I encourage pro players to sleep eight hours. I think it is extremely important. And you may say, Curtis, I'm a gamer. I can, you know, just give me a monster energy drink or give me like three coffees. I only need five hours and I'll be all good. Yes, hypothetically on paper, you, you will be able to play, you know, the same amount of games, but I just guarantee you that if you had eight hours sleep, you would you'd be feeling a lot better. You would be able to concentrate a lot more. You would get less tilted. You just have a basically a more, way more positive League of Legends experience. That's just in my personal preference. It's found to be really, really helpful. The next thing that I've, I've implemented in, in my schedule that's been a big game changer is doing some form of light exercise in the morning. It may be as small as doing a bit of yoga, a bit of stretching, a walk around the block, a few skips outside, a light jog, right, a light run, given that the gyms are closed, it's going to be kind of hard, but any form of light exercise. And the reason I really thought about this and like, why is this the case? Why do I feel better? How can I can, how come I can just play more games? And the reason is, I was just thinking, and you guys might resonate with this. We're gamers. We sit in the same chair on the same desk for like 12 hours straight. We'll just sit there and we'll become a potato. And it's so funny because at 9 a.m. when I just get into my computer, I've got my little coffee here, I'm feeling great. If I don't move and I sit there till midnight, you know, the same day, I progressively degrade. Like I start off as a human at 9 a.m. By 12 a.m. I'm like, you know, sorry, about 3 p.m. I'm starting to degrade. I'm subhuman and then by like midnight I'm um, some form of a lizard or so, like an alien or maybe a uh I, I don't know what's happening I, I slowly degrade and it and it's 
it coincides with my posture. So my posture gets worse. I get more sloppy in game. It just turns into a shit show. So um, I try to, you know, by moving in the morning, I just get my body feeling really, really nice. I'm able to concentrate for longer periods of time. I just, and this, this tip, coincides exactly with my other one that actually makes me feel really really good is in between games I like to get out of my chair and move around a bit and I know it sounds really weird But trust me, let's just say you you have a block of games where you say to yourself You know what Curtis you I'm gonna play two or three games right now and in between each game I'm actually gonna get up out of my desk out of my chair I'm gonna walk out to the to the backyard or the lounge room and I'm actually just gonna like do some push-ups or I'm actually gonna like do some jumping jacks or whatever it is. What it actually does, what it actually allows you, your brain to do is, it actually allows you to reset from what just happened in that last game. Because maybe you just actually had a really rough game where you know you you died a bunch, or maybe you had you had a forty-five minute game where you just lost out. And if you just instantly queue up to the next game, what's actually going to happen is that you're going to be so pissed off and tilted about what happened in the last game, it's going to affect your performance in the next game. So give some time in between games to refresh your body, loosen up the muscles, you know, refresh your brain, get feeling a lot more refreshed. So when you do go in, you're going to have a clear mind. You're going to be think you, you, you've actually given your time, your mind time to reflect on what you could have taken from that game, what you should have done better, what you could have done, maybe what you could have improved on, what you did really well, and it's just going to make you feel a lot better. So trust me, that will help you a lot. And actually, the last tip here, guys, is while you're in queue, you should try refrain from any forms of other entertainment like Facebook, um, Twitter, um, any form of other website, you know, those explicit websites, <laughs> you know, anything else, because what will happen is when you're going from full entertained Curtis to full focus Curtis, as soon as you get into the game, it's really hard to make that transition. But if all you're doing in between cues is watching VODs, watching league related content, thinking about the game, taking notes, whatever it is, you're not really going to, it's not hard to go from that into full focus, but it's extremely hard to go from happy, entertained, laughing at cat videos, Curtis, to I'm a robot, Curtis, high intensity, go, go, go. All right, that's what I found to be really, really helpful for me. Give it a go. Uh, it may work for you. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is how we as solo queue players and just as people, we tend to overcomplicate the game and overcomplicate improvement. I get messages every single day by people that are silver or gold or platinum and they say things like this Curtis um, it's like 35 minutes of the game and my jungle is here and my top lane is here and then my supports like building these items and like what do I do in the team fight like yes the all these small details do add up to be important in the long run if you're like a high elo player but for the I would say 90% of players guys all you need to do is these three things right I'm just gonna give you the recipe to get to diamond all right very very simple Number one, identify, uh, sorry, number one is have a very small champion pool. Three champions, ideally three, but four at max. Maybe if you're a platinum three player, you can have four if you really, really want to, but three champions max. Number two, identify one or two things at a time that you're really honing in on and focusing on, and specifically mid fundamentals like CSing, trading, champion identity. Um, you know, not dying to ganks, roaming, etc. And things that are basically all in your control in the first 15 minutes of the game. Because if you can optimize those first 15 minutes in a very simple way, you're going to be winning games and putting yourself in very favorable positions rather than those 35, 40 minute shit shows, all right? And the third one is play with intensity. Optimize your schedule, like I said before. Optimize your schedule, play with intensity, play less games, follow your own schedule, and you're going to be having a lot easier time. Just do those three things. Don't worry about, you know, if it's like 40 minutes of the game and, and I don't know what to build, should I build like Morellos or Leandris? Like, what's the small... Those differences and all these little item optimizations, rune optimizations, late game macro, little overcomplicated stuff, it really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things if you're not already a high elo player, all right, guys? You will get to that point, but focus on the fundamentals first. So the next thing I want to talk about, and you always, I say this a lot within my Discord, is why having a small champion pool is absolutely essential. Now, let's actually just look at the numbers. Let's just say you have three champions in your pool. Maybe you play Orianna, Vlad, and Zed. 
okay? And let's just say for each of them, there's 40 potential 4-0, there's 40 potential mid matchups that you could come up against. Um, so for Oriana, you can have 40 matchups, for Zed, you can have 40, and for Vlad, you can have 40. So that's a total of 120 potential matchups or iterations of matchups that you could potentially come up against. And that's not even including, you know, having an aggressive jungle in one of them and having a defensive jungle in one of them. There's so many more. Now, for every champion you add in, you're adding a, so many more things that you have to remember, okay? So, but if you only play three, 120 matchups, it's, you're going to come across the same matchups more often than not. If you play Orianna a lot, you're probably going to play Orianna versus Diana multiple times. But if you play one game Orianna, then Syndra, then Zed, then Yasuo, then, then Aurelian Soul, you're, it's very rare that you're going to see the same matchups again and again. And if you play the same matchups and again and again, you're going to be able to understand all the small micro details or macro details that are going to help you win that lane and win the game, even if you get counterpicked, okay? And so people don't understand that, and they overcomplicate the game because they, they, they haven't seen the matchups before, and they haven't been able to experience, experience the same matchups, okay? So this will really, really help you. And the other thing is that when you play less champions, you're going to be able to free up all that energy that is focused on learning the champion and focusing on all the micro, because it's going to be muscle memory, to focus on all the macro elements of the game. So for example, if I play 30 games or 40 games of Orianna, I'm not really going to have to think about, you know, Orianna's Q range or how much mana my W is going to cost or how much like Ws I can do in the laning phase or how I should position my ball in team fights. All these things, it's just going to be muscle memory. Like, I, I just know it. I know how to tether. I know the Orianna poke range. I know how to play these matchups. So then I can focus on jungle tracking, optimizing my warding, side lane awareness, tempo, all these, you know, ex you know, I would say macro concepts that will really up my game and allow me to climb and play out these games a lot more effectively, all right? So what we're going to do now is that I'm actually going to talk through an example I had. This was just a personal experience I had as a head coach. And kind of, this is kind of going to reiterate why overcomplicating things can prevent you from improving. All right? So, in 2018 of Die Wars, so I was a coach for 2017, 2018, 2019. In 2018 Die Wars, we had one of our most, we had that our most successful year ever. Uh, we had a really, really good roster, but more importantly, everything that we did was very simple. We had not many systems and processes, a very free flow year. The way we conducted practice was free flow, our conversations were free flow. It was very fun and joyful environment. Whereas in 2019, I took a lot more structured approach. E each player had to fill out worksheets. We had like this thing called a fundamentals worksheet. We had all the fundamentals listed down, kind of like on an Excel spreadsheet with like a rating at the top. And you have to rate each fundamental like 7 out of 10, 8 out of 10, 6 out of 10, and get players rating their own gameplay, reviewing things in a lot more structured way with a lot of worksheets, a lot of, just a lot of crazy processes. And what it actually did was overcomplicate the whole, the whole thing and just make playing the game not fun. It took, it took all the fun out of the game. Now, you, uh, what I realized over time is that the teams and the players that had the most fun playing the game actually played a lot better. So it's, it's interesting because fun and confidence kind of go hand in hand. Um, so if you are able to have a lot of fun playing the game, you're uh, slowly you're going to play with this very free flow adaptive mindset, which is going to allow you to build a lot of confidence, which, you know, it allows you to be a lot more satisfied with your own gameplay, which then, you know, it's like a never ending cycle. You're going to be fun. It's going to be fun. You're going to have a lot more confidence. You're going to play better, et cetera, et cetera. And this is why if you watch teams that kind of crumble in the LEC and LCS, maybe they have a really rocky start week three, week four. It's very rare that they get back onto their feet and become a good team. Take Team Liquid, for, uh, for example, this split. They were rocky in the whole early portion of the split. They obviously were overcomplicating everything. Um, they weren't really having fun anymore. The stress is built up. They're also stressed. So they're having no fun, no no, uh, no trust, no more stress, lack of confidence. And again, it, it's like a toxic cycle. So... We can prevent this, us as solo queue players, by always remembering, you know, and I'll get into this later in this video, but having a very fun, always trying to remember what made this game fun for me. How can I go back to what made this, this game fun? Was it a specific champion? Was it a specific way of playing the game? How can I bring back the fun in this game? So it's just an interesting question to ask yourself. Now... Now we're going to talk a little bit about reviewing uh, games as like a high elo player and low elo player. And what's the difference? What, what's the, some of the differences I've found? So when I do coaching with a gold player, 
I would actually look at about eight games, eight or so, eight or so games, and I would look at the first 15 minutes of the game because the first 15 minutes you're in the most control. And what I would do is I would I would watch all these games and you would start to see the trends. Is what do I feel like is preventing them from getting leads? Is it because they have they don't really have they have a lack of understanding about their champion identity? They don't really know how they want they don't really know how to manage the waves. Maybe they they weren't warding properly and always dying in the early game. What do they know not? know much about jungle pathing you could you could over time if you watch enough games you could really see in the first 15 minutes why they were either getting behind or why they weren't getting ahead and from this i would create one or two learning objectives like the ones i mentioned above where it'd be just be like all right um you know i want you in the first five minutes of every game is just not die to a single jungle gank or maybe for the first five minutes of every game, I want you to track the enemy jungler. Or for the first 10 minutes of every game, I want to make sure that you never have two trinkets in your inventory at the same time. Just a very simple, actionable step that um, will really help you help that person hone in on that specific fundamental. And do that all day. And if it takes you multiple days, so be it until that's a habit. And then you tick it off and go to the next thing until you refine all these fundamentals and it just becomes muscle memory. Now, what does a VOD review look like with a pro player then, right? So, generally, I use this specific strategy, and I, I don't really have a term for it. Basically, it's just reverse engineering. So, what we would do, I'd sit with the pro player or with the team, and would watch the game until something felt wrong. So, it might be as small as, okay, why was the enemy bot lane able to position this aggressively in the lane? Because maybe in the game, it felt really weird that the enemy was able to position this aggressively in the lane. And for a low elo player, they wouldn't even recognize this. But for a high elo at the pro level, literally someone positioning in the lane aggressively can impact the game completely. And so then what we'll do, we identify this as the problem, and then we'll go back straight to level one, and we'll, we'll figure out the core reason. And it might be as small as, oh, maybe the, the bot lane actually had to, uh, the bot lane actually leashed level one, so the enemy bot lane got to lane first, so they actually got control over the lane. Or maybe the support wasted a ward level one, spotting out the jungler, and so he didn't have a ward, so when they were starting to push, they were scared, so they had to let the enemy um, push them in. It could be something so, so small, or maybe the support was just mispositioning in the lane, on the wrong side of the lane, which then allowed the enemy support to pressure your AD, so then he had to play back, and then they got pushed on the lane. It's very, very small details, and that's how I would do it, this, this reverse engineering thing, okay? And you guys can use this strategy within your own games in solo queue. So I do this for myself. I'll look at my VOD, and I'll, I'll go to the point where it felt wrong. Something felt off. Maybe... Um, the enemy mid laner was able to get to fight over me. Maybe I died to a jungle gank. Maybe I had to blow flash somewhere. Maybe I was just low mana or low HP. Then I would go back, rewind the VOD, and I'd find what went wrong. Why was I in this position? Was it because I built the wrong items? Was it because I wasted a ward? Was it because I wasn't tethering properly? What did what led to this situation? And you'll find that by doing this strategy or use under undergoing this strategy, you'll find the underlying key concept that is actually um, and the key trend that is causing these problems in your game. So it's just a, a, a neat little trick you can actually do. I'm going to share one of my pet peeves, all right, guys? So this is something that happens way too often, and it actually really annoys me that it happens this often. It's, let's just say I get, I'll get a DM, or maybe I'm, in my, I'm streaming in the Twitch chat, and someone says, Hey, Curtis, can you look at my OPGG? I don't really know why I'm not climbing. Can you give me some advice? So I click on the little link there. The OPGG pops up. The first thing I look at is the amount of games played this season. And it will say 20 games, 10 games, 15 games. And I'm like, are you serious? You need to play a lot of games. And I ask him, why haven't you played any games? Well, they say, oh, I'm scared of playing ranked, or I'm scared of getting flamed, or I don't know what chance to play, or whatever the reason is. It's all an excuse. My content helps you fast track improvement, but it's not a cheat. It's not a cheat code. It's not like you type in Coach Curtis in the, you know, in the code and then you just get to challenger. I wish it was that easy, but it's just not the case. My content actually helps you fast track. You still need to play a lot of games, okay? If you don't have 100 or 200 games, you're just not going to reach your peak whatsoever. There's no cheat code, all right? So play... Just play games, play ranked games, okay? You need to play a certain amount of games to even get to your level where you can even get tested, all right?
One of my biggest breakthroughs recently due to my coaching or just talking to a lot more lower ELO players is actually just realizing the lack of straight focus within games nowadays. And I've really pondered on this and I've thought about this a lot and I was thinking, why is this the case? How come people just aren't focusing in games and they say they want to climb but they're just not focusing? And I'm like, there has to be a deeper reason to this. So I was thinking and thinking and thinking and I've come to some form of conclusion. I might be wrong, but this is just my personal hypothesis. So I believe that nowadays, because we have so many ways to get those constant dopamine hits through Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, porn, Tinder, Netflix and chill, like all these things that you can actually do to give you dopamine hits, we, we've we become very, very obsessed with the, the short-term games of dopamine. So what actually happens, we have a, a very, very short attention span. So as soon as the game goes into a slight lull state, we lose focus, we stop util utilizing our prefrontal cortex, we literally just stop thinking and we go into autopilot. We rely on our muscle memory to play the game out. We don't push ourselves, we don't test ourselves. So it's like the, the analogy I like to use is like, it's like we're going to the gym and we're lifting the same weight every single day, every single week, and we're wondering why we're not growing. And so I said this in actually one of my last videos and I truly believe this, if you can play, Three games a day where you focus hardcore, like I'm talking hardcore focus for the first 15 minutes of each of those games, you will have a significant improvement in your gameplay. And what I mean by focus is literally you're, you're using every bit of your brain power. It's like when you're in an exam at school, you're using every bit of your brain power. You're thinking about jungle tracking, mini map awareness, side lane awareness. You're thinking about all the little details. And yes, after those games, you're going to be exhausted. You're going, to, you're going to be talking to me on Discord saying, Curtis, I had the best game, but I'm absolutely stuffed. And that's what I want to hear because maybe you can only play two or three or four of them. And I guarantee you, you're going to improve a lot more. You're going to test your limits. You're going to realize how good or bad you really are. And you're going to know exactly what to improve on. Because if you just autopilot, you're not testing yourself. So you're not really going to know what you're bad at. So this is the key, guys. So really try this out. This is a big breakthrough recently for me. The next thing I want to talk about is some of the problems I actually work with with pro players. So I got some, one of the questions I actually got recently in my Discord was, you know, what do you actually work with, with a lot of pro players? And there's a lot of different things. So one of them is actually mental blocks. So because pro players, a lot of the time, have been playing the game for so long, a lot of them actually have like a mental block first, maybe a specific champion or a specific player or a specific team or even a specific moment in the game. So for example, maybe this player um, was constantly versing another pro player in solo queue where they kept losing to Cassidy. And then maybe they had such a painful experience is that whenever they verse Cassidy, they just had this mental block where they just think to themselves, I actually can't win this game. I can't beat this Cassidy. He's just going to outscale me. He's just going to win. So a lot of the, a lot of my work actually went with what identifying what these mental blocks were for people, were for players, and then working through them, identifying them, breaking through these barriers. So when they do go into the game, they're not clouded and not foggy through all these crazy weird mental blocks. Um, another one of them was just a lack of confidence. Sometimes players get a lack of confidence, so I had to work with them to build back that confidence. Maybe some uh, one of the other problems was players not uh, clicking with a specific meta. So the meta always changes when you're a pro player. So you always got to pick up new champions. Maybe it shifted from a very late game meta to a very early game meta. So they had to shift their whole champion pool and they weren't really clicking with it. So I had to find a way to, you know, I guess, expand their champion pool, improve their knowledge of the game in this specific portion of the game, find ways to, to help them click with the new meta. Um, also, another one which was really interesting was um, helping people find their own identity as a player within a given meta. So, for example, Doinby is the perfect example. Even when the meta shifts, he has his own unique take on it. So you don't want it to be what I call a meta slave, is whenever the patch notes come out, they just play the most OP thing. Yes, that is important to do, but a lot of the time, what makes the, a, a player the most scary is having their own unique champion pool, their own unique spin, or their own unique take on the meta. So actually working with players on that, um, some of the main other problems were like not trusting teammates, you know, maybe dealing with pressure outside of the game, affecting their in-game performance, like, you know, maybe pressure to win from other teammates, pressure from their family, pressure from their own and self expectations, imposed expectations, um, maybe even out of game problems hurting the in-game performance, like, you know, their girlfriend or their lack of sleep or depression, all these other problems. So this is some of the stuff I all used to work with with pro players. It can be pretty quite intense, actually, and very demanding. So, and there's a wide range of things. 
And it's, it's interesting, uh, an analogy I call a head coach for a team is, I call them a firefighter. All they do all day is they just put out fires. There's a fire there, there's a fire there, you just got to put out fires all day. That is your job as a head coach, unfortunately. Now, this next one's very, very interesting. This one might personally resonate with you, resonates with most players I've spoken to it about. This one's actually called Invisible Narratives. Now, base, these are actually one of the most deadly things that um, prevent most players from uh, climbing. Now, you may ask, like, what exactly is an invisible narrative? Now, basically, an invisible narrative is like a story we believe in, in the back of our mind, that dictate our emotions, our beliefs, and our actions. And they can be either positive or negative, but most of the time they will be negative, or the ones that we're going to talk about are negative, and they require introspection and time alone to actually figure out. And examples of these, these invisible narratives that are just running in your brain in the background are things like this. Oh, my champion, my champion pool's holding me back. I'm just not talented enough. I'm too old. I can't really improve. I'm too old. The matchmaking's never fair. Riot just doesn't want me to climb. A Riot always gives me bad LP games. I'm not a good league player. I can't do anything about that. I'm just not talented. All these toxic, invisible narratives that will just run in your mind, and no matter what you do, these will, these will chip away at you and prevent you from actually climbing. So... My advice for all of you out there is take some time, switch off your phone or put it away in another room, sit on your bed and get a notepad and actually just think, close your eyes and literally just think, what are some of the things, what do I truly believe about my own level of play and why do I feel that way? And it, it might take you a while, but slowly you'll realize all these crazy invisible narratives that are just popping up. Oh, I'm too old. I'm too young or... I'm not good enough, I don't have enough talent. Yeah, the, all this stuff is bullshit, and if you truly believe, and if you can break down these mental barriers, and I'm happy to have this conversation with any of you, if you are struggling with that, just DM me. I'm happy to work through some of it with you, but um, first of all, it really, really starts with being aware with it, all right, guys? And really being aware of it, then you, then you can start to undergo the change, and just to tell yourself, no, that is bullshit. I'm not believing that, all right? Let's talk a little bit about confidence. So I actually truly believe that League is a confidence game. And an interesting example of this, let's actually take it back to when maybe you last learnt a champion. Maybe, let's just say you just learnt Echo for the first time, and you just you played 5 or 10 games of Echo. It's funny because the first 5 or 10 games you play of a brand new champion, you will actually play quite well. You actually will have a lot of success a lot of the time. You will just have a lot of success. And I've always wondered... Why is this the case? How come when I first time a champion, I actually do quite well? And it's interesting because it's like ignorance is bliss. The first, those first 5, 10 games, you have no expectation about your level of play. You're just going in with this childlike mentality, this very free flow, open mindset where whatever happens, happens. And you're just having fun. You're genuinely having fun. You're enjoying this new champion. You're testing it out. But you're not overcomplicating anything and you have no toxic expectations in the back of your mind. Because you know you're not good at this champion, so you're just going to play without limits. You're just going to try it out. And generally it actually works. So the way it works is the first 10 games go quite well. The next 10 games, when you start to be more serious about it, you start to int your ass off. And then after that, the next 10 games, you'll start to get a little bit more clarification and then start to do well again. Which is quite interesting. And this is why sometimes the people that tend to overcomplicate the game struggle to climb so much. Whereas like the people that play with a health, healthy, adaptive, free flow mindset actually climb because they don't have any of that those toxic expectations about their own level of play. But remember, if you're just playing with this free flow mindset, it can currently only get you so far. This is why a lot of you will have those friends that just get to diamond really easily. And then after diamond, they really, really struggle because they need to they need to actually understand the underlying concepts to, to make it more consistent to climb a little bit further than that. Now, this is actually one of the main reasons and partially one of the main reasons why young kids are so good at picking up new skills. So, you know, when you teach a, a language to a young kid or you, you, you teach a young kid skateboarding, they can pick it up so much easier than older people because they have none of that mental baggage. They have none of those toxic expectations. They're just, they're just doing it, having a free flow mindset, willing to adapt to the situation as, as it occurs and just having fun. And again, it's tying back to that fun element. And this is super, super interesting to think about. Now, to regain this confidence and fun element of the game that I've really been talking about a lot, there's two things that have really helped me personally. The first one is get rid of all these toxic expectations about your own level of play. 
accept reality that, you know what, maybe I'm actually not that good anymore. And I li this literally happens to me every single year. I'll, I'll literally tell you the loop. I get to Challenger, I take a break from the game for like one or two months, I come back, and then I'm like diamond, I'm like a diamond three level player again, and then it takes me months, sometimes months, to get over that barrier, put my ego aside, admit that I'm at a diamond level, and then eventually find my champion pool and get back to Challenger. That's just how long it takes me personally. Whereas some players, they're able to put their ego aside very easily, um, and, you know, so admit that they're not that level of play and can improve so quickly. But the people, a lot of you guys out there that are not having fun with the game, have all these toxic expectations about themselves, they get really annoyed at when they make a mistake. It's because the expectations of themselves are so high and they're unreasonable. And when your expectations don't match reality, then it's it can be very, very toxic and, and it really prevents you from gaining confidence or any form of confidence. And the second thing is have a think about the things that you are good at or some of the things that made you play the game in the first place. Maybe it's you found X champion, maybe you found Lux really strong, uh, really fun. So you want to play a lot more Lux. Maybe um, you were really, really good at skill shots. Maybe you were really good at CSing. Really remind yourself, what are the things that I'm very good at? Let's go back to those things. Let's actually start with what are the things I'm good at. Let's let's go back to the things that I loved about the game in the first place and just come in with an open mindset. Come in with the open mindset. Who cares what happens? Have a small champion pool. Just play. Just play with any expectation of winning and losing. Yes, you may lose a bunch of elo. You may go down an entire elo, a entire tier, sorry. Whatever. You have to do this in order to grow. You can't just hide in this little bubble of like toxic expectation and just not play ranked or complain about things. Otherwise, you're just not going to get anywhere. This is you got to do this, have this painful experience, accept reality, and then you can make your climb all the way back up. This is just the process sometimes, and this is just the way it's found. I found it for me. Um, it works for me every single year. So the next thing I want to talk a bit about here, guys, is emotional investment. And I've, I've actually talked a little bit about this on stream, but I've, I find there's a fine line between competitive intensity and toxicity. So in my experience, some of like the best players that I've ever worked with, they always got annoyed when they made mistakes or something got in the way of them winning a game. And sometimes this can get out of control, but I've always thought like, what does this have to do with being good at the game? And I've always thought about this. Well, this is so fascinating. So I realized that strong emotions, both positive and negative, actually help memory stick in the brain. And I, was, and I did a bit of research and I realized that this was a survival mechanism for when we were hunter-gatherers. So let's just say you went out um, hunting, for, foraging for food and you had this really scary close encounter with a, a big grizzly bear and it nearly killed you and you ran away, you escaped and you got out of there. Well, it would pay dividends for you and it would be really helpful for you to remember that experience and burn it in your brain um, because you don't want to get a you don't want to die. You don't want to go to the same place where the bear was and um, or, or not bring your stick with you to kill it or whatever you want to do. You you want you really want to remember that experience so it doesn't happen again in the future. So whenever something painful, a very painful experience, a very strong emotional experience happens, our brain tends to remember that so we can avoid it in the future. And it's the exact same for positive things. If we have a very positive experience, maybe you found a place where there was a lot of berries, we will remember that because that allowed us to, you know, get berries, which allowed us to live longer, which made us really happy. Um, so again, it's all these things that tie back to our, our primal roots and a survival mechanism. And it's same for League, right? So if you um, overextended and died for a gank, but you had no real emotion, like emotional connection to that specific event, then you're probably just going to do it again. Hence why, like, if you autopilot games it's very rarely going to help you improve because there's no emotional connection to anything that's happening in the game. But I still believe you don't need to be really angry or really upset. There must be some form of like a threshold for when it actually registers information in your brain. Um, but again, this is just, for some, re for some reason, this is just like rung true for me in all my experiences with coaching people. Um, and even in real life, like say you had a car crash because you were using your phone. Um, I guarantee you, you're not going to use your phone again while driving because, again, you had such a painful experience. You don't want that to happen again. So, again, this is just my personal opinion. I might be wrong. I'm not a scientist or whatever. But um, the main takeaway I wanted to get across with this specific point for you guys is, you know, get excited about the game. Get a little bit intense. Get, get that intensity and passion flowing. And it really will help you not make the same mistakes again. Um, and it'll help you really climb in the long run. 
Now let's talk about one tricks in high elo. Now I get this all the time where people say, Curtis, why do you say Vlad is bad in high elo when there's like a, they link me like an OPGG of like a 500 LP EU uh, Vlad one trick. I want to settle this once and for all. So I don't have to say this again and again and again. Okay. So let's just say you get this Vlad, this high elo Vlad one trick. Yes, it is theoretically possible to get high elo on any champion in the game. But for majority of players, guys, you're not going to be able to replicate what this guy does in these matchups. So for example, let's take Dunn. You know, the Victor player, the high elo Victor player in NA. He's so good at Victor that even on counter matchups, he will know how to minimize. He might not, he might, may even know how to win them. He will know how to itemize, know the runes, know all these little small micro details that he's able to either minimize or do better than most people. But for the average player playing this champion, they're not going to be able to do this unless they put thousands of game in, games into Victor like this guy has. Yes, you can do this, but overall, you're not going to be a great mid laner. Dunn probably would never be able to be a pro player because he only plays Victor. But he, and he's never going to be re reliably be able to get Challenger if, like, say, Victor got completely nerfed. It's going to be a lot harder for him to climb again. Again, these players have got to levels on that champion that is so high that it's not really... It's not likely that you guys are going to be able to play that many games with that champion. So you're never going to have that same success. So... Just because they've had success on it, it's not representative of that champion at all. That's just an extreme case, okay? And I'm talking about 95% of you guys who are going to play the champion. You are going to struggle in solo queue, okay, guys? So that's just my take on things. Um, and, you know, keep that in mind when you're looking at those one tricks in high elo. Now, you may ask, then why... So in high elo, I wanted to talk a little bit about this, is why having pressure is so like, is more important as the higher elo you get. So let's look at the top elo Korean mid laners, for example. If you go on OPGG, you look at Faker, Doinby, um, Ian, you look at Zhao, who's like rank two at the moment, you look at all these high elo Korean, uh, uh, Showmaker, all these high elo Korean mid laners, you'll notice that the champion pool at the moment is champions like Silas, LeBlanc, Renekton, Pantheon, Syndra, Lucian mid, all these very high pressure mid laners, and it happens every year. And it's because in high elo, um, pressure is so, so important. It's because it simultaneously makes your jungler's life easier because they have way more options of things to do on the map. And it also simultaneously makes the enemy jungler's life harder because they're, they're getting invaded. They have way less room to gank. They can't walk into river. They can't do objectives. They just have to play defensively. So give, and given at this ELO, when you when we're talking about like the highest level of play, these players have a very clear, a very clear way or very clear idea about how to push lead when they're giving those, given those small windows or they're given the tools to be able to carry. They can use those smallest advantages with mid having push to be able to invade, set up a dive, get an objective, counter jungle, etc. and do all these crazy things. But in lower elo guys, the pressure doesn't amount to anything because the, you know, the junglers won't know how to utilize the pressure. They're just going to do full clears on the jungle anyway. They're not going to do objectives. It's not going to amount to much. So in lower elo, you'll find that games get extended a lot more so people can get away with pick, like blind picking Cassidy or picking Vlad and Victor every game, blind picking Victor. That's why I say in the low elo tier list, you can, Lux is a good champion because she's just going to free scale, get to that 15 minute ARAM then you're just going to win. Whereas like in high elo, if you play Lux, they're just going to invade your enemy jungle. They're going to start dragons at like eight minutes, do Rift Heralds, break mid tower, and your game will just go boom, all right? So it's just interesting to talk about that for a second. Now what I want to talk a little bit about is hard work versus talent. So I'm going to use two pro players that I've worked with in the past. We're going to talk about uh, Shurnfire and Ray's. A uh, Raz was a high. He was a high. He played for Jin Air in LCK. Then he went to uh, LMS and he played for G. Is it G Rex? And then he came over to Os and played for Direwolves. Now Raz was an example of a very talented player. He's a very naturally talented player. He doesn't have to play many solo queue games. Basically, he would he would always perform well no matter what. Whenever the whenever we played on stage, he would always pop off. Whereas someone and he's pretty much always been like high elo. Whereas someone like Schoenfire, for example, he's the definition of hard work. This guy is not talented whatsoever. He's the definition of like, if any of you have watched like Naruto, this guy, he just grinds. And I'll tell you an interesting story about Schoen. And Schoenfire is the jungler for Team Liquid Academy. You know, you might know him as the main, he played main jungle to substitute for Broxa. He's been like rank two in Korea. He's been top 10, he's been rank one in NA. He's been basically been like rank one in multiple servers. Really, really good player. 
in O's back in the day when I was challenger, he was literally like Diamond 5. This guy, he was like a joke in, in solo queue. Everyone used to say, Shurnfire, you're trash. I don't want Shurnfire on my team. Give up on the... He used to, people used to tell him to give up on the game every single game. Like, why are you still playing? You're so bad. Get out of my games. But he continued to play and play and play. And he had to play so many games. Now, this leads me to my main point about the difference between hard work and talent. Now, talent, in my opinion, and it's done a lot of study, but this is my personal opinion, has two art art overarching benefits. The two overarching benefits of talent are one, the speed of improvement. So talent, naturally talented players, they naturally get to a high low way, way quicker. They just pick up things way, way quicker. And then you've got the second thing, the benefit of them, is that they can actually reach a higher skill cap. But we're talking like at the, the, the top, top, top. So like, I personally believe to be a world champion, you can't just do it off hard work. To be a world champion, you would need to be, have hard work and be extremely talented. But you could definitely get to high challenger. You could definitely get to LCS or LEC, play in the pro leagues as just hard work. But if you want to reach the top, 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 then the dip, we're talking like faker level, winning world championships, then you need to have a, a, lot, uh, a lot of talent as well. So for most of you guys, um, you'll notice maybe some of your friends at school or uni they'll just get to diamond so quickly that maybe they, they've barely played the game and they get to diamond within like two seasons. Whereas you, you've been playing for like four seasons and you're still struggling. Yes, that's because maybe they're just naturally talented at the game. They will get to improve the game uh, naturally quicker than you, but it doesn't mean that um, you won't be able to reach that level. It just takes a lot more time for you, which, you know, it's just a sad reality sometimes. But in my personal opinion, hard work out is way more important than talent. I would way rather a person on my team that works incredibly hard, like Schoenfire, who's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly talented, versus someone who's just naturally talented and just barely plays the game. Because you'll realize that that person, when, when, um, you know, when shit hits the fan in a game, they're the one who will really shine because they have that competitive intensity. They really, really want it, um, and then they'll just outperform. So yeah, that's just my interesting little take on hard work versus talent. And then I want to talk in another case study about talented player was King. So King was another 80 carry. He plays for C9 Academy at the moment. He was one of my friends here from Melbourne. And I'll tell you a story about King is that um, I was at an internet cafe tournament in the city when I was, I think I was 17. Was I 17, 18? Was well, 17 or 18. And um, I was at this tournament and I saw this kid playing. I was standing behind him and I was like, what the hell? This guy's insane. His mechanics are insane. I've never seen anything like this. Like, I was shocked. I was a challenger player at the time, and this guy was, uh, I believe he was only plat one. And I looked at uh, my friend, and I was like, this guy has got insane mechanics for a platinum player. And I spoke to him after, and he barely played the game. I was like, dude, this kid is insane. I want, I want to play with this kid. And so when this guy turned, he was only 15. When he turned 16, I believe, or 16 or something, um, I said, Look, you want to come play for, come play with me? And this guy, King, turned from a random solo queue player. And what do we know? This guy um, ended up, you know, he played on Direwolves. We won championships, went to MSI World. Now he's in NA, playing in the NA Academy. A really, really good um, midlander got rank, uh, sorry, 80 carry, got rank one all the time. And this is why... AD carry is interesting because AD carry is a role where talent is a lot more important. So um, AD carry is probably the most important role in the game for natural talent. You probably can't get super high elo um, with a lack of talent in AD carry. You kind of need to have that because it's a very mechanically or micro intensive role. Whereas mid lane, you're losing a lot, using a lot more of your brain. Whereas yeah, AD carry is just straight mechanics. So um, yeah, I thought that was a really interesting story as well. And I want to talk a little bit about the upside and downside of spamming games. Now, spamming games is, is an interesting one. I get this question often, like, you know, wouldn't you prefer just playing a lot of games? Because you're seeing more, you'll see more of the same matchup, you'll see a lot more differing situations. Isn't that just going to be better for you? But um, what I realized is that spamming games can be really good for feeling fresh and sharp mechanically and knowing your matchups. But... It can also have a significant decrease. It can also significantly decrease the intensity of your games and actually sometimes make you get worse at the game. I've actually known players that have played a lot and have actually gotten worse. They literally got worse at the game because they were playing 
where while they weren't focused, they were playing while tilted, and then they actually lost confidence, which actually made them play worse over time because they constantly were feeding that loop, you know, playing with a lack of focus, playing, getting tilted, and then playing worse, losing confidence, etc., etc. So it actually can make you play worse. You've got to be quite careful about that and find the correct amount of games for you. And lastly, this is the last question, the last one I want to answer here is, I get this question, then Curtis, why aren't you super high ELO given you have all this knowledge? Now, I want to talk a little bit about me and my personal ranked experience. So every season, like I mentioned before, I literally have the same process. So I end up in Challenger, but I go through this loop where I take a break after the season ends or something for like one or two months. And it takes me so long to find my champion pool. Um, and the, I think the reason it takes me so long to find my champion pool is because I can play so many champions to a master tier level, but I can only really play three or four champions at a time to a challenger level. Like, to put in the time to make my champion go from master tier level to challenger it takes me quite a bit of time. And because, yeah, I know so much about the game, I have this, this habit of overcomplicating the game as well. But generally, it just takes me a bit of time to find my champion pool. Because as well, I have so much mental baggage about everything else that happened in all the other seasons. So I'm always thinking, how come I can't play like this in Season 10, like the way I played in Season 9? How come the way I'm playing in Season 9 didn't work in Season 8 or whatever it is? I'm always trying to think about the game at a very holistic approach. And what's actually changed with the way the game's played because I played for since season one and it's always been really interesting me for me to see the game evolve so a lot of the time I just overcomplicate things and I test things and I'm test all these different champions or improve my champion pool in different ways and um, I just overcomplicate things and because I'm experimenting so much sometimes my mind just goes boom and then I lose all my confidence because I'm playing way too many champions and then I just need to like go back to scratch find my niche champion pool and then I eventually climb so uh I have a very unique problem because I've been playing the game for so long, so don't worry about me. I'll get there. Um, but yeah, just, I have a very unique problem that it just takes me time to, to get there. So um, I will... And well, Actually, last thing, what's really interesting is like in Season 7 when I was a head coach, I still got like 1,000 LP playing Oriana only. And I'm like, but how did I do that? Because I was playing with a free flow mindset. So I know that if I can play and get that confidence, find my niche champion pool, I can just get high elo whenever I want. Um, so... This was a very long video on a bunch of different stuff. Um, I'm not sure if this was helpful or not. I thought it'd be interesting to do a video like this. Um, and yeah, just let me know if you have any questions. If you want me, to, if you want to send me more of like a personal question, you can message me in Discord. Uh, otherwise, I'll looking at all the comments. Also, make sure to enter the make sure to enter the giveaway. I've got a coaching giveaway going on right now for the 10k subs. So thank you so much for that. And yeah, I'll see you around. And thanks for the support, guys. Cheers.